Welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast, presented by Orion Advisor Solutions and hosted by Dr. Daniel Crosby, Orion's Chief Behavioral Officer and New York Times bestselling author. Each week, Dr. Crosby interviews a fascinating new guest on a range of compelling topics, from literature to psychology to financial wellness. To learn more about Dr. Crosby's behavioral finance work at Orion, visit www.orion.com. Hey, Standard Deviations listeners. Did you know that you could be receiving continuing education credit for listening to certain podcast episodes? That's right. There are continuing education credits available for CFP board advisors, along with SEMAs, CPWAs, and RMAs for certain episodes. The Advisor Academy is Orion's free continuing education platform for advisors where you can get CE credits on the go. The platform offers a handful of podcast episodes that you can either listen to or watch and receive CE credit. Check the podcast description for more details or visit orionadvisoracademy.myabsorb.com and use code PODCASTS, that's PODCAST with an S, to sign up. Note, not all podcast episodes qualify for CE credit. You must listen or watch through the Orion Advisor Academy to receive the credit. Visit orion.com slash advisor dash academy to learn more. Hello and welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Crosby, and I'm joined today from the floor of the Conference of African American Financial Professionals Conference. That's a little redundant, but we're going to roll with it. I'm joined by Michael Finca, a previous guest of the show whose episode was so popular uh, that elements of it found their way into my new book, The Soul of Wealth. He is the Chair of Economic Security Research at the American College of Financial Services and the co-founder of Income Path. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here again, Daniel. Good to see you. Yeah, your episode was so well received. I get people talking about it all the time, and I, I feel like it gave lots of people the excuse to buy a sports car. You talked about the power <laughs> the power of you know investing in a car if it got you access to sort of a a cars and coffee type relational exchange. And I think a lot of people took you up on that. Well, that's that's great. The podcast was definitely worthwhile. So. <laughs> well, here we are in, in the middle of August. We've just gone through quite a market downturn. And I thought I'd start by asking, what did you see? What, what from your vantage point did you see during this recent swoon where we had the third highest VIX reading in, in history? So Daniel, I don't, I don't know if you know, but about 15 years ago, I did research on what happens to assessed risk tolerance when the markets fall. We found that during the global financial crisis of 2008 and early 2009, when financial advisors brought a client in and did the standard risk tolerance assessment test, when the market was going down, they were far more risk averse. So there was this inverse relationship between risk aversion, people's willingness to accept investment risk and the performance of the market. Um, and that was, I think, the first window into the reality that people do have this emotional response to market downturns. They want to take less investment risk. They start getting anxious. There's nothing surprising about that particularly. But one of the most important things that we found was that this correlation between risk tolerance and market performance was incredibly strong on the way down. On the way back up again, it was not that great. So we're talking almost 90% of the variance in assessed risk tolerance scores on average during a downturn could be explained by the market. But when the market starts going back up, then all of a sudden these individual preferences start coming back in. Some people are willing to take more investment risk. Some people are willing to take less investment risk. So risk tolerance assessment is very much influenced by emotions on the way down. And I think that's what we saw recently, that uh, people had this emotional response. We all do to seeing the balance of our investments go down. And this is, of course, one of the age old issues with financial advisors, which is how do you coach a client to be able to withstand those market downturns? And we can have a long conversation about that. I know that you're an expert on this topic, but uh, I think one of the most important things that advisors can do is coach the client ahead of time to anticipate market downturns or find some sort of a way to put the blinders on and allow them to accept that volatility 
without experiencing the extreme emotions that we very often experience when we see that we're losing. Yeah, so that's fascinating. The the fear is immediate, right? Like when it's on the way down, that emotion of fear is immediate and the the risk aversion is is immediately impacted. But on the way back up, people remain a little gun shy and perhaps that that willingness to take risk doesn't doesn't pop back quite as quickly as it as it was eroded. Yeah, you know, I want to make a point about that data because I think it's very important to remember that because the correlation is so strong on the way down. What that means is that naturally risk averse people and people who say, who otherwise would be saying that they're risk tolerant, are both experiencing a disinclination to take investment risk when the markets are falling. So I think oftentimes what happens is that people think that they have the courage, but when they see that they're losing money, all of a sudden they're less willing to take investment risk. And actually what we found was that those who were closer to retirement were in fact more sensitive to the downturns. So, you know, as you get older, as it becomes more consequential to you, you know, if you're on the off ramp to retirement, maybe five or 10 years away, then a loss of 10 or 20% of your wealth can have a big impact on how well you're going to live or how well you can imagine that you're going to live, especially if you think of it through the lens of the 4% rule. It's a, you know, it's, it's like your whole lifestyle has gone down by 4% per year, or sorry, by, by 10 or 20% per year. And then there's also this, this issue that um, it becomes more salient. And when it's more salient, we tend to respond more emotionally. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons why I did some research on what happened during the March 2020 global financial, well, actually the March 2020 was the COVID crisis. So when the market fell, we saw that people started pulling money out of stocks. And it was those who were 10 years away from retirement who pulled the most money out of stocks. In fact, there was this, this consistent relationship between age, and this was defined contribution participants. So a huge sample. These are average investors. As people got close to retirement, they pulled more money out, which of course was a terrible thing to do back in March 2020 because the market market eventually recovered and it didn't take that long for the market to recover. Um, and it's one of the reasons why older investors tend to underperform it's because they tend to be more sensitive to fluctuations in the market. They're more likely to pull money out after they lose. And of course, that's that's kind of like the inverse law of demand. So we tend to want to buy more stocks when the prices are higher. We tend to want to sell them when prices are lower. That's the exact opposite of what you would expect when you go to the grocery store. If milk goes up in price, you don't want to buy more of it. But stocks, when they're up in price, people do want to buy more of it. When they go down in price, people want to buy less of it. And that leads to consistent underperformance. And that underperformance is really more acute among older investors. And I think one of the reasons is because they, they are more sensitive to loss. So this is a great potential exposure to risk not anticipating the market is going to go down and then making the wrong choice. Yeah, it's it's rational enough that that older folks would want to be more conservative since they're more impacted by it. But as you say, that that exposes them to greater levels of underperformance and then it goes on to impact their lifestyle. How how do you think about like how do you think about overcoming that? What do you counsel people to do? Well, um so the research that we did found some really interesting conclusions. First of all, people who were in target date funds. So very often, these are the least sophisticated investors. These are kind of the ones that you would have thought would be most likely to respond emotionally to a market downturn. They didn't do anything. It was it was very uncommon for them to trade in their retirement accounts. And I think the reason is because they weren't thinking about it. They weren't even aware of how much money they had saved. They weren't aware of how much money they would lost. What it meant was that they were probably blissfully ignorant. They they didn't realize what was going on. So putting the blinders on is one strategy. Of course, the bucket strategy is an example of trying to put the blinders on by saying, all right, you know, if the market goes down, it doesn't matter because that's not money we're going to touch for another 10 years. So advisors can use techniques to try to get people to simply ignore what's happening in the market and not fixate on their losses. But we did notice that among those who were in target date funds, when they did phone up their record keeper, they were more likely to trade. So far fewer of them traded, but far more who phoned up their record keeper ended up trading. As opposed to those who were in an advisor managed account. 
If they were an advisor managed account, they were far more likely to fill than someone who was in a target date fund, but the advisor was able to help talk them off the ledge. So they were actually significantly less likely to trade. So the human advisor, and, and of course, we know this from behavioral science. We know that we cannot control our own emotions very well. So we have the elephant, you know, it's, it's, we're trying, we, we're the rider, we're trying to control it. But if the elephant wants to sell stocks, the elephant's going to sell stocks. But if you have an advisor who is not experiencing the same emotion, they can have a conversation with you and talk you off the ledge. The real danger are the self-directed investors. So what we found was that it was the self-directed investors that were far more likely to call. And then when they called, because they didn't have an advisor to talk them off the ledge, they were far more likely to trade. And it's one of the reasons in retirement accounts why the nurses outperform the doctors, because the nurses are more likely to be in the target date funds. The doctors want to manage their own investments. And because they tend to have these emotional responses, they tend to significantly underperform. You know, we do a couple of things that I think, you, you know, your comments sort of jogged in me. One, we have a bucketing strategy uh, called Protect Live Dream. And in one bit of research by SEI during the great financial crisis, they found that people who were in a bucketed named account were 10 times less likely to go to cash than, than someone who was not. So a lot of the behavioral stuff we do is so simple, but so powerful. I mean, the the idea of creating a safety bucket and calling it a safety bucket seems so sort of pedestrian and simple. And yet I think the the impact of it can be pretty pronounced. You know, another thing that I'm a big proponent of is, is measuring risk composure alongside things like capacity and tolerance. Because uh, one of the things that we do is we measure risk composure in people. This is the behavioral or the emotional element of it. And for people who have low risk composure, which is a high level of emotionality, a high level of emotional lability, a high likelihood that that downturn is going to rock their world, we have our advisors talk to them and, and take them through a bit of a pre-commitment, right? To say, hey, look, there's going to be times that you're going to be scared. There's going to be times that you're going to call me and that you're going to want to sell everything. And on that day, it's going to be my job to tell you no. And that pre-commitment, that inoculation, that pre-experiencing of it is actually quite powerful. And then when that day comes and they do indeed call, I think the advisor looks kind of prescient. Like any, any thoughts on this sort of, uh, you know, inoculating people against volatility before it happens? You know, absolutely. I, th there was a guy named Harold Avinsky, very famous financial advisor. I think one of really the, the experts at integrating behavioral finance theory into practice. And he would continually in meetings with clients remind them that the market was going to go down and say, you know, the market is going to go down. These are good times, but just remember, we're going to have to deal with these bad times. And when the market goes down, you're going to call me. And what am I going to say? I'm going to say, you know, just be patient. We've got a long-term plan. Don't worry about it. And so what he's doing is he's getting them to imagine in advance how they're going to respond emotionally and then what he's going to say, and then they're how they're going to respond to that. So to them, by the time it actually happens, it becomes old. It helps them manage those emotions. I just thought that was brilliant. It's such a, a great idea because by the time it happens, Harold would sometimes phone up his clients and say, are you doing okay? And he's like, yeah, you know, this is, this is what you told me about. And of course, you know, I was going to have this response, but I don't actually have this response now that I've already, you know, practiced it a few times and I've been through it. So it's almost like you're coaching the client to manage the inevitable risk that comes with investing in a portfolio that has assets like stocks in it. Uh, this just, you know, it's, it's par for the course. And, and I think that these types of behavioral strategies, I'm not, I'm not surprised at all that, that bucketing is so effective. I, I would do that in my own practice. I mean, I think a lot of academics like myself get a little bit cynical about bucketing because sometimes it's positioned as doing something that it doesn't actually do. You know, it's still a portfolio, right? It's still a percentage of stocks, a percentage of bonds, and a percentage of cash. And if you have 
more money in cash because you're doing the bucket strategy, then that means you're actually going to underperform a little bit because there's going to be a cash drag. However, if it lets you manage investment risk better and you don't underperform on the equity portion of your portfolio, that's where the magic happens. Like that's where bucketing actually is effective is that it helps people manage those emotions, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of it. You know, I, I would do it myself, but you have to recognize where the the benefit is coming from. And it's, it's an entirely behavioral thing. Yeah, I, I think I've, I've certainly heard academics kind of poo-poo the idea of bucketing. And it's like, look, do you want your pizza cut into six slices or eight slices? It doesn't matter. It's still a pizza kind, kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, I, I understand all this points. But I think we have to, as an industry, start thinking in terms of uh, behavioral optimal or realized optimal right. and not spreadsheet optimal, right? Because yes, any any amount of cash is not spreadsheet optimal, right? But we're not we're not counseling, you know, uh, automatons, perfectly rational people who operate in a vacuum. We're we're counseling and and coaching and advising emotional human beings. And so I think there's a behavioral optimal there, even though there's certainly not a, a portfolio optimal or a, or a mathematical optimal. You know, this, this whole thing has made me think about the communication thing. And I saw something interesting emerge on LinkedIn right before my very eyes. And, and I'm interested in your take with respect to communication, because there really seems to be two camps. You know, the, the one camp is, hey, in, in bad times, you've got to over communicate. Like this is your Super Bowl advisors. You got to be there for, you know, for your clients. Now, this is where you make your money. You got to over communicate and be in their lives. But I'm also, you know, it, uh, it also brings to mind study that, that Betterment did years ago, you know, Betterment, of course, the, the robo advisor and Betterment's always had sort of a strong behavioral finance tilt early on when there were volatile days in the market like we experienced last week they would send out these email blasts right so they would send out an email blast to their entire customer base and go hey there's nothing to worry about you know with a couple of bullet points about you know this is normal yada yada and what they found is that those email blasts like across the board actually did more harm than good because, you know, people who were sort of blissfully unaware to use your word, people who may have been in a very, you know, conservative target date type approach now get this email that says there's nothing to worry about. And they go, well, wait, what am I not worrying about? Like, you know, they, <laughs> and so, so, so what Betterment did, which I thought was very effective is they would, they would send emails to people who logged in. Right. It's like the the supposition yep. is that like if someone's logging in, right, check their account on a bad day, then maybe there's some evidence of concern. But if they're not logging in, we're not gonna we're not gonna engender worry where there is none. How do you think about this this continuum from like deep communication, call all your clients, talk them off the ledge, versus literally do nothing and kind of sit on your hands and, and wait for people to call you? You know, I'm absolutely unsurprised to see those results. They're absolutely consistent with what we saw in our own research, which is that it is, you know, the question is conditional on reaching out. What happens? First of all, the blissfully ignorant, the target date fund investors, they're far less likely to do anything because they're just not thinking about it. And that kind of a reminder would activate them and say, uh oh, is there something I'm supposed to be thinking about? And then you check the balance. That's a slippery slope, especially if you don't have access to a human advisor to actually help you manage those. So I think the bottom line is that that's the value of the human advisor to explain, to reassure, to make you feel comfortable. You just need to know that this is not something that you need to control yourself. There's actually part of that emotional part of your brain is the part of the brain that wants to correct errors. And so we have this emotional need to try to correct this mistake that caused us to lose money. But if you're communicating with the advisor, you're actually using a different part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, that that can help tamp down that emotional response. You don't feel like you need to handle the error correction on your own. You can manage that with your advisor. You can delegate to the advisor. 
but it is that access to the human being I think that makes all the difference now. So it is conditional. First of all, I, I do think it's, a, you know, it, it, the question becomes, is an email enough? Or do you actually need to talk to somebody? And then can you identify which of your clients is more likely to have that kind of response? You mentioned before that you can do a risk tolerance test that both captures the economic idea of risk tolerance, which is willingness to accept variation in your future goal. So that's the way economists think about risk tolerance is if I'm saving for retirement and I take a significant amount of investment risk, it means that if I get lucky, I'm going to have a a lot more money. If I get unlucky, I'm going to have less. Money. So that's what risk tolerance is all about. It's a variance in the lifestyle. However, there's this different concept, which is a behavioral response to loss. And that is different. I think more experienced investors, if you've you know, been through this a few times, I went through the global financial crisis. I went through the 2002 recession, went through a few other experiences like that. I'm used to it. I'm an experienced investor, probably less likely to respond emotionally to a downturn. Younger investors right now have not really seen a downturn in the last 15 years. So they haven't built up that muscle of being able to ignore what's going on. Uh, so, you know, some people I think are more likely to be able to handle that. Some people are less likely to be able to handle that. That's one of the things that it would be great if you had a test that would allow you to identify which of your clients are more, more vulnerable. And for them, they're probably the one you, you need to call. Yeah, that's that's I think the the lesson here, the lesson of the betterment study, right, is is about personalization and determining who's vulnerable rather than having a one size fits all approach. Uh, it's the number one thing we're hearing from our advisors is personalize, personalize, personalize. We want to offer a bespoke, you know, we want to be able to offer a bespoke uh, experience to to our end clients. You're hearing that again and again. And from a behavioral perspective, I think that's what is required not to kind of uh, cause panic where there was none previously. It also feels, doesn't it, like like people are learning the lesson, uh, whether rightly or wrongly, like in the future, that every every dip gets bought. I mean, whether you're talking about COVID, whether you're talking about last week, it just feels like we haven't had a prolonged downturn in a very long time. That'll be true till it's not. Uh, but but in the meantime, uh, it seems like people aren't all that rattled by it because they've learned to kind of buy every dip. You know, Daniel, that is such a, we, we could probably talk for an hour on this topic, which is this idea of mean reversion in finance. So mean reversion is when the market goes down, people have this negative response prices go down and eventually people, the market recovers, the economy recovers, things go back up. It shouldn't happen that way. I mean, people should know in advance that recessions are temporary. Stock prices should not fall by 50, 50% as they did in a global financial crisis. Um, but what this creates is predictability. And it has happened so frequently. And in fact, it has happened more consistently in the United States in recent decades than in past decades. This reversion, this quick reversion. To, there's no reason why it should happen. It's it, The be, explanations are only behavioral. In a perfectly rational market, you know, we experienced a recession, but investors really didn't care that much about it because they know that eventually after you know, 18 months, it's going to go away. But instead, stock prices fall. And what it does is it, it creates, first of all, that shouldn't happen, which means that there may be a prolonged period where stocks underperform. You may not see that immediate need reversion. I think you have to be prepared for that. And it does bug me a little bit sometimes when I see advisors say, well, if you just wait two or three years, the market will come back because there is no guarantee that that's actually going to happen. That's probably something that you shouldn't be coaching clients and then it, it doesn't happen and they're disappointed by that because that's always a possibility. You know, I. I started saving for retirement in 1998, 1999. I invested in stocks in my 401k because I was young and stocks did not outperform cash over the next decade. So that's a possibility that we haven't seen in a long time, but it is always a possibility. The markets may not consistently revert the way that they have, but statistically they have done that and it creates opportunities. Now, it also creates opportunities for people who want to elevate their risk during periods where the market is falling. That actually is rewarded by a higher return on your equity investments 
then if you're investing in periods like today when valuations are very high. So they're, they're, we can have all wisdom of valuation-based asset allocation. But historically, if you believe that, if you believe in mean reversion, then you also should believe that you should adjust your asset allocation based on the optimism or pessimism of the market. Because when the market is pessimistic, you're rewarded as an investor for taking great risks. Yeah, it's uh, I have a son. I have a son who's very interested in markets, and and every day after dinner, he's like, "Teach me something, you know, teach me something about the stock market." And so we've had all these little mini lessons. Uh, and the other day we, we learned about bubbles and, you know, how long the market can stay down. And, you know, I showed him, uh, I showed him a chart of Japan. I showed him the NASDAQ and the, you know, during the dot com bubble and said, Hey, look, like usually it bounces right back, but sometimes it takes 15, 20, 30 years. And that's why, you know, being, being sensitive to valuations is, is so important. You've done some research recently that I thought was fascinating on, on tracking, right? Because from a behavioral perspective, again, sort of the the blanket advice is don't look at it, you know? And I mean, you'll even see all these things about like, you know, the more you look at it, the worse you do. Because of course, if, if the market's, you know, whatever the number is up 55% of days, down 40, 45% of days, and you're looking at it every day and, and a loss hurts twice as bad as a gain feels good, it feels like you're always uh, in pain. But then if you look at, you know, the, the longer you stretch it out, the lo- uh, the better the odds get. Uh, how how has your research taught you about re- tracking and, and how has it refined this very simplistic view? So I recently did a study where I looked at retirement savings. And one of the things that I asked is whether or not, first of all, you track your own retirement savings. I also asked whether you tracked other aspects of your life. So do you track your health? And one of the things I found that was surprising is that trackers save considerably more for retirement. And tracking your health was a strong predictor of tracking your retirement savings. And tracking your retirement savings was associated with saving more, saving a higher percentage of your income that haven't more saved. So that was a bit of a surprise to me because I am a big believer in automated savings. So I feel like you save the most when you just don't pay attention to it at all. So this is one of the benefits of having these default saving systems in the United States is that with 6% of their income in the retirement account, the employer managed matches 3%. And by the time they get to retirement, lo and behold, they have enough money saved. They haven't touched their investments in the meantime. They perform just fine. So that would have been the optimal to me. What was surprising to me is that the trackers save considerably more. They're more motivated to save So I think that there is this problem with tracking. One of them is a benefit, and that is that when you see progress, so I don't know if you track your health, but this has actually motivated me to start tracking my health. And when I see my health improve it, when my view to max goes up, I'm motivated to continue doing what I'm doing. I'm motivated to do it a little bit better so that I can continue that upward trend. So tracking can be motivated. It can get us to change our behavior, to do better. However, tracking can also have unintended consequences, which is exactly what I found in the research on retirement savers who manage their own investments. When you're tracking, then you see your loss, then you see the balance go down, and you're more likely to make a trade that is not in your long run best interest. So tracking is good for motivating saving. And it may even be be good for motivating taking investment risk because you see your money going up more. But tracking has a dark side, and the dark side is that you're more aware of losing money, so you better be prepared for that, or you're more likely to make some kind of mistakes. Otherwise, set it and forget it is better. So, you know, this is also one of the reasons why I think, like, auto-escalation is a good idea. Because auto-escalation accomplishes the same thing that we see among trackers, which is that tracking motivates them to save more. Auto-escalation just does it automatically for them. They save more over time. And so they end up with larger savings balances again, not necessarily because they made the active choice, but tracking forces that active choice. It forces that reflection. That's fascinating. So tra- track in good times, set it and forget it in bad times, maybe easier, easier said than done. Easier said than done. Yeah, if you can. I started, uh, I started tracking my protein intake and my calorie intake about four and a half months ago, just as sort of a, a buddy of mine was doing it. And 
he showed me this app. And so I, I started to just tracking those two numbers. They're the only, you know, proteins, the only macro I, I care about. I, I follow calories and protein. And the mere act of tracking those two things, I've lost 45 pounds with no loss in my lifting in 45 pounds, four and a half months, just there was so much going on so much going into my body that I was not like counting, you know, so much snacking and sort of nonsense that was happening that I wasn't aware of. And so tracking for health has been, you know, revolutionary. It's amazing to me how much it has illuminated, you know, my, my process. But there's a weird, there's a, there, there's a place where there's a divergence there because my health is more or less always within my control. At least what I eat is always in my control. The markets are not always in our control. And so I can see where, you know, it makes sense to track in sometimes, but not in others. It's a very, a very cool finding. Well, Dr. Fika, uh, thank you for all of your contributions to the art and science of uh, good planning and investing. If people want to learn more about your work, uh, about your startup, where where can they find you? Yeah, so the the company that I run is called Income Path. You can go to IncomePath.com to learn a little bit more about that. You can also read my research on Think Advisor um, and Advisor Perspectives, or you can read my academic research on SSRN.com. Hey, beautiful. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks for tuning in to Standard Deviations. If you can't wait till next week for more behavioral finance insights, visit www.orion.com. All opinions expressed by Dr. Daniel Crosby and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of or endorsement by Orion and its affiliates, subsidiaries, and employees. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for legal, tax, and investment decisions. The opinions are based upon information the participants consider reliable.